Yeah, yeah, and I just have to be clear. Unlike what MSNBC said, I'm happy to deal with the consequences of what I say. It's a really important counterweight to the mainstream media to have a thriving independent ecosystem. Unfortunately, we don't have a thriving independent ecosystem. Certain ideologies are constantly ascribed to me that I've never espoused, and it's very frustrating. But there's a lot of amazing independent journalists that do great work online, and they end up shadow banned or demonetized or censored in some way by big tech. You can't just like eliminate journalism. All those things he's talking about, who would like pave our roads or who would whatever. Journalists ensure government accountability. Like, by the way, the mainstream media has done horrible things. I get it, that's annoying, but that doesn't mean we should eliminate all journalists. There are countries where there are no journalists. We know what those countries are like. They're authoritarian. We should give a shit about COVID. We should give a shit about the fact that thousands of people are dying a week and our government is out to lunch. No, I totally agree with you 100%. And it's really frustrating that people on the internet can't engage with that. And instead, they just want to like yell at the woman that made a TikTok about it. You know, it's like. Hello and welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the geek creators and influencers who built nerd culture. I'm your host, Pete Pishke, and I have with me the incredible or infamous, depending on who you talk to, Washington Post reporter Taylor Lorenz. Taylor is here with me today so we can talk about the sad demise of Western journalism. I have a lot to talk about that. We're going to talk about her career, her recent book, Extremely Online, The Untold Story of Fame, Influence, and Power on the Internet, and bust some Lorenz myths along the way. Uh, welcome to the show, Taylor. Thanks for having me. Oh, Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. I swear, anytime your name pops up, it it, it sets the internet ablaze. You know, all of the, the, the conservatives are all a buzzing, and then they have the people on the other side of the left, and they're like, no, you can't say that about Taylor. And the people on there are like, no, she's the worst. You know, she's 60 years old and went to Swiss boarding school, and it just goes from there. Well, they have a lot of conspiracies. They also say I went to Columbia Journalism School, which is hilarious because I would have never gotten into Columbia Journalism School. <laughs> They have a lot of conspiracies about my life, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it is interesting. You are you're probably the reporter I can think of the most, at least right now, that is most often the story, almost as much as you do stories, which I don't think there's anyone. There used to be more reporters like that in the past, but right now I think you, you're probably the biggest one. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I write about internet culture and online culture. So everyone I write about generally has an audience. Um, and yeah, I think that like there's a very lucrative industry um, in terms of the, in the right wing media of like making content about me. Like they make a lot of content about me, which they then monetize and use my name for clicks. And that's how the internet works. So <laughs> it is, it is. And that that is part of what your book talks about extremely online. I read that over the weekend. It's really well done. I thought it was a pretty good, um, a larger outlook on the history of social media and uh, especially like video content. It was so interesting reading um, everything that, like especially that went on with Vine. That wasn't really something I was paying attention to. What was, what surprised you working on this book? Cause this is kind of like, um, this is kind of like the apex of your career. It's like all of your career working in social media and editing and journalism and all kind of led to this point. So what have you taken away from working on this? Yeah, well, it was so interesting to work on a book because it, it took me two and a half years to write. And that's the longest I've ever worked on anything. Um, normally, I can barely like stay at a job for more than a year. I get bored and want to do something new. So to have a project go on that long, it was it was interesting to just like deep dive back, you know, um, through Internet history. And I learned a lot. Um, I mean, it was just kind of, I guess, what shocked me and I think what shocks a lot of people maybe when they read the book now is just how like maligned content creators were for most of internet history. Like only in the past few years have the Silicon Valley people even acknowledged the content creator industry world. I mean, for all of the 2000s and 2010s, like these big Silicon Valley venture capitalists were incredibly negative about the influencer industry and, um, and hated on it and just talked so much shit about it. And then now they're all like, oh, the creator economy, new media. And it's like, yeah, exactly. You guys are like 20 years late, you know? Um, I think they finally kind of it registered for them. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was 
fun to kind of reexamine also just uh, you mentioned Vine, some of the other platforms that fell by the wayside, but how they sort of fundamentally change culture. It is in a weird place. I, I know what you're talking about. When even back when I was in J school in the early 2010s, it, it, it was important, but it wasn't really taken all that seriously. And that's one thing I've always appreciated about your reporting is you seem to have a curiosity about how people actually engage with these platforms, you know, how the you know the day to day people are using YouTube, they're um, posting on Twitter, Facebook. They are interested. In, in, they're interested in Instagram. That's actually the media people are most um, connected with. Uh, the mainstream media, news media. That, that's kind of like farther down the line. That's not how, in my experience, news people like to look at it. It's it's usually like, no, we're top dog here, and yeah, you're one of the few people that. Home. <laughs> That's right. You're one of the few ones that push back on that, which is something I've uh, long appreciated about your reporting. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I wrote of sort of about that. I mean, the book is essentially about the demise of legacy media and legacy institutions. And also, I think it speaks to the failure of digital media, which is the environment that myself and I think you're also a millennial journalist, but like throughout the 2010s, like so many of us made a name for ourselves on these sites like BuzzFeed, Mashable, uh, you know, Daily Dot, uh, Mike.com, where I used to work. And those, the business model of those companies was fundamentally broken. And I think we saw the cratering out of digital media as well. Um, and so, I, you know, it's just the real digital media is the content creator ecosystem, basically. And I think it's just interesting what people thought digital media would look like versus what it ended up actually looking like. True. That that often is true of news. This is kind of I'm going to try to share screen this because it's it's important. See if share screen will even work with me. It always fights me. OK, oh, yeah. so uh, Taylor that set the Internet. This this has got me. I'm not mad at Taylor, but this whole this whole conversation people have had around this has got me so mad. So Taylor posted this video. Well, on, let's, let's be was clear, it on your TikTok way. or your YouTube? I posted on TikTok and YouTube. It's a four minute long video and every single right winger that posted it clipped out the majority of the video where I'm talking about the problems with the mainstream media. They clipped all of that out. And so anyway, they just clipped the beginning and used the beginning and tried to make it seem like I was saying something I wasn't saying. No, well, I think even what they what you have here though i thought what you said was 100 percent defensible so here i'm just going to play this 100 i i just i think they missed all the context like i mean yeah but anyway so not to interrupt you no, uh, no it's fine it's fine uh here we go roll it higher journalism industry is basically in a free fall today the los angeles times laid off 115 employees they wiped out their entire dc bureau in an election year major media companies like buzzfeed news have completely shuttered their news operations time magazine also just laid off a ton of people and oh sports illustrated basically shut down last week pretty much the entire digital media ecosystem that myself and a lot of other millennial journalists came up in has been completely hollowed out meanwhile hundreds of workers at conde nast the parent company of pretty much every major magazine from GQ to Vogue to The New Yorker to Vanity Fair are on strike because they're also facing impending layoffs. Even if you do get a job, journalists' salaries have been stagnant and even declined. And by the way, we don't make that much to begin with. I don't think people understand how bad the world would be without journalists. So I, I'm going to stop it right there for now because everything you said there, and even though we're, we're kind of on different sides of the political aisle, some I 100 percent agree. Like there is nothing you said there that was wrong, like nothing at all. All you said there was correct as far as I understand the issue. And like if if people were being honest and I think I think most people who aren't saying anything understand this, too, because this is this is this is a problem everywhere. It's not just it's not just um, Kotaku and Gizmodo. And it's not just The New York Times. It's you know, it's it's the Federalist. It's the post millennial. It's the, you know, the tiny little, I, I, I was doing something with the giant freaking robot. I mean, it's everyone. So. Yeah. It's everyone. I totally agree. And I think also people, it's funny you say we're on opposite sides of the political aisle. Like I, there, uh, certain ideologies are constantly ascribed to me that I've never espoused. And it's, it's very frustrating on the internet because Obviously, as a reporter, we're very limited in sort of what we can say. I, I have very strong opinions on what I can say, but I don't know. A lot of the – it's frustrating sometimes when people – I think people just – they're like, especially with – I don't know, Glenn Greenwald did this video on me recently, and, um, like, they're constantly trying to tie me 
to these establishment companies as if I'm some like establishment figure or like I support the Democrats or something. And I just have never been that person. I've never espoused specific ideologies that are often like put on me. And it's it's very frustrating because you can tell I can tell people so many times over and over and say, like, have you actually read my work? If you actually read my work, you'll see that like I'm not this is not what I've ever argued for, you know, um, but they don't read my work and they just want to yap about me on the Internet. But that's fine. <laughs> well, to my annoyance, it, it's like what I'm seeing online, the response to this over the last week, they're not engaging with the argument at all. It's like, well, what they're just they're just making fun of you. They're just mocking you. They make yeah. they make stupid jokes about your age or or your background that no one actually wants to engage because they can't because the argument you're making isn't it isn't an ideological one it's an argument about you know this is the state of reality the news business is in really bad trouble and you are saying it's bad and and their response is ha ha that's so funny this is this is so good uh, or I, I don't know i don't quite understand it because so many people seem to be people who would know better maybe because they're independent they as journalists they don't feel like they have a vested interest in the state of the industry, but I'm like the industry where it's at. I've I've felt it personally as it's taking it's taking just everything with it, and along the way, everyone that was reliant on that coverage. A hundred percent, and it affects independent journalists. Like, I mean, I in my ideal world, we would have a thriving independent media ecosystem. I obviously started as an independent journalist. I'm a huge supporter of independent journalism. I think that. Um, it's a really important counterweight to the mainstream media um, to have a thriving independent ecosystem. Unfortunately, we don't have a thriving independent ecosystem because we just have, I mean, we just have this like disaster of like these tech companies that kind of control everything, have hoovered up all the ad dollars, and then also kind of act as um, intermediaries between independent journalists and their audience. And so, you know, there's a lot of amazing independent journalists that do great work online and they end up shadow banned or demonetized or censored in some way by big tech. And I think that's a huge problem. And I wish that these people that are yelling about my TikTok would engage with those things because it's like it, it doesn't this these problems are not unique to the mainstream media, although the mainstream media is affected by them. They're also the problems. Mm -hmm independent journalists no exactly it's everyone it's everyone because it, it's it's the whole system i mean i had this experience i think i texted you about this when i was like i got hired to do the news division for a small entertainment uh news site that was so exciting literally the day i got the sign papers are like we're sorry pete we're gonna we're gonna have to pull back because like google just killed us and we don't know if we're gonna survive and that was like oh that was the first sign to me this is back in october like oh something big has changed and as we now well no i guess people don't know but as as you and i know and people who work in news uh all most of the sites most of the news content people engage with is based on ad dollars and so as google has because of ai maybe it's ai spam because of the things that google are doing the the amount of money you get the cpm uh is way it's way low it's lower than almost it's ever been and so it's come to the point where no one can make a living doing this and that means no more no more news sites you know uh, we, what what uh sports illustrate sports illustrate just went down which is crazy i growing up the thing was huge that was like that was a huge institution and now it's gone it's crazy and again the independent journalists like I, if look if we didn't have the level of censorship and moderation on tech that we have I think I would be a lot more optimistic about sort of people's ability to generate like in you know to, to run independent media businesses but I mean look at what's happened with the coverage of the war in Gaza right now like you see people getting their accounts taken down I think of Kat Tenbarge a reporter at NBC who wrote a great piece on um, AI generated like revenge porn and teenage girls and um, her the entire link to her story is censored and you cannot search for it on threads because it has the word porn in the url that is crazy to me like just this really really like over the top moderation that i feel like a lot of these tech companies engage in it makes it really hard for new then they don't want anything to do with news too tiktok and instagram they've been open that they don't want news on those platforms so it's like okay so we can barely get news from social media we're constantly against like being shadow banned you know demonetizes all this stuff we can't like get it online, you know, like the mechanics of traditional media are broken. So I think it just leads leads 
to a system where we're all much less informed and there's less media and journalism happening today than previously. Can you help? Can you I mean, this is really important for people to understand it. It's so, yeah, it's like it is the big dog. So it is the places that Taylor is often publishing, but it's not just the big dogs. It's your local outlets. It's your you know, it's the people that do, you know, your local obituary. It's I mean, it, it's it's everyone. And so it feels like to me, it's like people are like they're in the tent. They're watching the uh, tent pole burning and they're like, ha ha ha. This is great. This is yeah, wonderful. 100%. But we're well, they're, just... they're in the tent. That thing is going to fall on you, man. I um I made a video that's a follow up on my TikTok and YouTube about stats related to areas without journalism. If you live in an area without a local newspaper, you are going to pay higher taxes. There's more government spending. There's less oversight. Um, there's more labor violations, like per capita. All of these things have been borne out. All of this stuff is data. You can check on the Press Freedom Place that I linked to um, in my video, but. That's bad. That's a bad deal. Like we want accountability focused journalism happening in our communities and we want people rooting out bad landlords or bad, you know, bad actors or crime coverage even, you know, and I, I get it. I get that journalists can be annoying and hugely irresponsible, but that doesn't mean we have to like eliminate journalism as a whole, especially local journalism, which is so important. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating. So I, you know that you actually are but putting aside the enormous outrage and i'm looking at some of these tweets that tweet i just had with greg gutfield that thing has twelve thousand. i mean retweets twenty three thousand likes i swear taylor it's like it's like you say literally anything and then it's it's like a million uh views on twitter it's it's just crazy i don't know what it is about you that drives people up the wall but you've it's like a I know. Superpower. I think it's because I'm an outspoken woman and I don't fit into their like notions of what they want me to be. Like it like there's something about me that infuriates these people. And I mean, I think part of it, a lot of it is misogyny. I don't think it's all misogyny. I think a lot of people just drink the Kool-Aid and they sort of want to villainize people. And I'm not the person I think that they often try to paint me as. And I think that that also sort of like gets them riled up. Like I'm not a mainstream media, like institutionalist type of person. And I don't know, but yeah, it's crazy. So many of the myths I've read about you are th very focused on like your upbringing. So they're like, she's just one of those people who just instantly was handed a ed big editorial position never true, magazine. By the way. Let's, just be, let's just be clear. I went to public school my entire life. My dad worked for a small local construction company like I I'm so grateful to be raised in I mean I grew up in New York City and outside in Connecticut and in a nice area in old Greenwich old Greenwich is like this little cute little town that has a great public school system which is why my parents moved there in the 80s but um you know I don't have I, I don't I, I don't I've never gotten a dollar from my parents since I graduated and my family left Connecticut I mean as soon as we were out of public school they left and we moved to the middle of the country and they live a very quiet life in the middle of the country working in an industry that is an incredibly offline industry. My family is very hard workers. They are, you know, came to this country from other places and worked really hard. And it's like, what's the problem? But by the way, even if I was a billionaire, even if I was like, you know, the daughter of Jeff Bezos, so what? Like my points still stand. Like, it's not like, is there some like, do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so my points about the media are the same. So it's like, I'm not trying to, it's just such a bad faith argument. And often, by the way, the people making these arguments are the richest people in the world. It's like Mark Andreessen, who's a billionaire, or Glenn Greenwald, who lives in a literal, like, compound, you know? It's like, I'm like, guys, I'm a journalist. I'm making up. I'm, like, very happily employed. I, most journalists are unemployed right now, but, like, I live in like a shitty rental, you know, like it's just so like <laughs> genuous. <laughs> uh, very true to working in uh, the news industry. Uh, no, but it doesn't. That's the thing that's wonderful about journalism. It, it doesn't really matter who you are. It's like the points you are making. Are the facts true that it doesn't it doesn't matter what who the who the person reporting it necessarily is, as long as, you know, the information is verifiable. Who cares? A hundred percent. But it's like, I, I think that's why I think because they don't want to, you know, um, 
you know, engage with what I actually have to say. They want to like litigate whether or not I did a study abroad program for a year, you know, or like something mm -hmm. like that. Like, it's like, guys, like, who gives a fuck? Like, uh, first of all, I'm in my like late 30s at this point. Like, I I've have had a whole career for 15 years in media. Like, engage with me on what I'm saying. Stop trying to like, I you know, I don't know what the, what their point is. She's right. Without journalists who would arrest criminals or put up fires or build our roads or take care of the sick or deliver our mail or pick up our trash or keep our water and electricity running or defend our country. So, yeah, thank God for journalists. Look, crazy lady, everyone understands how bad the world would be without journalists because we haven't had any for decades. Um, and it just goes on from there. Uh, his, his kind of point like is because of the media bias of the system that that the news industry journalists haven't been reliable for a long time. And so it's like, we basically didn't have any, if that makes. I, the, the thing is, is like, if he didn't cut out the second part of my video, he would know that I actually talk about that in the second part of my video. I say like, by the way, the mainstream media has done horrible things and they're not without, you know, the, they did not, part of this is their own fault by, you know, reporting misinformation or like, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. I, they're not without fault is my point. And so I, I totally sympathize with um, people that are angry about it. But the point is, is that to get so angry, it's like, what is that saying? Like you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's like, so you can't just like eliminate journalism. All those things he's talking about, who would like pave our roads or who would whatever. Journalists ensure government accountability. Like if you want your neighborhood to be functioning well, or you want a functioning democracy, you do need journalism. I mean, in our system, that plays an important role in uh, in government oversight and in, um, you know, accountability. So, you know, I get it. I like I'm no fan of a lot of big media operations, and I totally hear they've pushed. They certainly push narratives in certain situations. I get it. That's annoying, but that doesn't mean we should eliminate all journalists. You know, that's just stupid. No, I I agree, and it, it's. The model that they think is so great that is being adopted is basically we're going to take people who are working in news. You could tell me you're wrong, but this this kind of goes along with your book. That basically we're just going to move people who are working in news and we're going to put them in the influencer box. <laughs> we're like, okay, you did, you wrote articles, well now you do videos on YouTube. But that comes with some very heavy caveats, which m might seem minor at first. They might seem like minor differences in the short term. You know, like a like a boat that's off its navigation by a little bit, and over a distance that becomes a great length. Uh, there are the the differences between an influencer and a journalist, even just the priorities. That's going to lead to very different outcomes. Absolutely, yeah. And I I think about you know some of my favorite journalists, um, like this guy Billy Binion at Reason or Elizabeth Nolan Brown. She's also at Reason. Um, you know, these are journalists. Elizabeth Nolan Brown focuses on like sex work and accountability and just like government overreach in that way. Billy focuses on policing and police violence and um, just, you know, kind of like the the way that the police system operates in America and often impinges on our own rights. They're doing such important work. Neither of them is like a huge TikToker. Part of the reason, you know, Billy especially can do these like months long investigations into these like police departments and get justice for people is because he's writing at a news outlet. Thankfully, he's writing for a news outlet. Reason is funded, I believe, by like donations and like it's a nonprofit or it's a, it's a nonprofit, but it's like it's definitely funded. By yeah, yeah, yeah. It's attached to the Reason Foundation. It's which... attached to this bigger thing. Right. So it's like, OK, so that's a somewhat more stable job in media. But if that was to go away, you were like, hey, just make TikToks about this. The 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 economics do not support that work. And so, again, we're losing oversight. And I, I really think we need oversight. <laughs> like, look at the government. We need oversight on the government. And right now, journalists provide that really important role. And I don't think TikTokers are going to take their place. Unfortunately, I'm a huge believer. In TikTok. I mean, look, I think news can happen on TikTok, but it's very hard to support yourself, especially when TikTok itself and Instagram and all these other platforms don't want news. They don't want news on there. It's too political and too controversial. They just want you to go on there and watch some funny videos and buy ring lights, you know? Mm -hmm. Even even YouTube, which is one of the more friendly platforms, you never know. You never know that someday someone, for whatever reason, they're like, eh, you know, they yank the chain, you're gone. Absolutely. Uh, 
uh, it's 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 frustrating. It's like it's yeah, I'm with you. I'm I'm very much with you because I understand that there are problems, but news journalists do have a proper role in society that does help a lot. And there are just certain things that won't work as influencers, like like you were saying with Billy Binion, crime is not, you know, crime. And this happens a lot with news. This sounds so weird to people because they've heard, of course, the phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. But often when you are working at news, you're covering stories that very few people are going to end up reading. You might be working on a project and you could be researching days, weeks, months, and nothing comes from it. You know, but those kind of stories are really important. You know, even though most people aren't looking, maybe you'll have someone that's like an advocate or someone that a researcher and they get that information. And that stuff just won't work on YouTube. It, or it, I love YouTube, uh, TikTok, but it... but also those institutions aren't accountable. If you call up a police department and you say, "Hey, I'm writing an article for Reason or the New York Times or the Washington Post," they're gonna be responsive to you. If you call and you say, "I'm making a YouTube video," they generally don't care, and because they just know it's gonna go off into the ether of the internet. And so I just think it's. You know, it's hard. I, I think we are losing something. And again, like you can acknowledge that we're losing something while also acknowledging that these big places have been irresponsible and done a bunch of dumb shit. And I'm not like sympathetic to a lot of them in a lot of ways. But but that's again, but like it's just this extreme take to like remove all journalists from society. You're going to be living in a society with no oversight and accountability. And that's pretty that's stupid why would you want to live in that type of society i live here in sioux falls south dakota at the moment to take care of family and we basically don't have a newspaper we used to have a newspaper the argus leader and it's it it's technically alive like technically but it's like owned by like some foreign company they don't even print in town it's like it's just like i swear three or four sheets it's it's it barely it just it doesn't exist like ignore it and the major problems we have in sioux falls like there are increases of crime. There's a ton of corruption with going on with our, our mayor and city council. Like the development, the developers in our town kind of run rough shot over everything. Like there are major problems. And if we had news people and one of my friends, um, I'll, I'll give him a shout, Joe Sneeb, who's trying to kind of run an independent paper here, uh, the Dakota Scout, which is excellent. If you live in South Dakota, definitely check it out. Um, it's it's very like it, like it, if it wasn't a passion project for Joe, I'm not sure he would he would keep doing it because the margins are so slim. But we need that. Like we really do need that because if we lose that lifeline, I mean, there's so many elements in society, just like you said, that we wouldn't we would have no idea what's going on, you know. And it's it's like uh, it's like when you you know you have your tooth extracted and they numb your face, you know, someone someone could poke you in the face. You wouldn't feel it. You need you need you need to know that something's happening there, and journalists are that sensor. But I sorry, at this point, I'm talking to the the peanut gallery. No, I totally agree with you, 100. percent And it's really frustrating that people on the internet can't engage with that, and instead they just want to like yell at the woman that made a TikTok about it. You know, <laughs> it's like it's just I guess that's the problems with the internet and why we can't have nice things. But um, but yeah, it's it's worrying. I worry uh, about it. This is just a thought that came to me. Uh, I did that Frost interview a year ago, and so I thought. By the way, that's kind of why I was pull at seeing if you could come on now because that's like it's like uh, about a year apart. So I thought that was kind of a nice, a nice uh, bookend. Um, and I, you know, it's interesting. Doing the interview took a lot of work, and I tried very hard to be to be balanced. I think it shows. Unfortunately, being fair doesn't always generate traffic, as you. As you well know, and so it to to get, and I think it has thirty thousand views on YouTube. But I fought for like every one of those views. So anyhow, it's a Gundam. Who's a YouTuber I generally like? Um, he does this video. Here's everything that happened to G Four since it closed. January eighteenth of twenty twenty three, Frost decides to make her final annoying post before deleting her Twitter account forever, and she was never missed or noticed again. And you know, conveniently, he skips. My video now, obviously, this is a bit of an ego trip for me. Like I'm, I'm going to admit to it. Um, but it's like, if if a newspaper covers a topic and you feel it got something wrong, hey, fix this, please put a retraction, an update. You could go to it if you if you feel like it's wrong and you want to, you know, a different news org, they can get up and they can talk about. It. It's a Gundam. I, as much as I like the guy, he just this is a critical thing to miss. He does his research. So I have my doubts he didn't know about it. Um, it's like, I can, I can, I, I can do anything. I can say anything 
email anything, doesn't make. And this is kind of the problems with the influencer model. And here's my last point, and then I'll I'll, I'll let you finish off. We can move we can move on. But it's like it's like the people they have so many comments about what you do, Taylor. Like um, my buddy Jeremy over at the quartering. Taylor Lorenz is one of the biggest cyber bullies on the internet, and I couldn't be happier that her job, her path, her career is going down the tubes. But the behavior of the influencer class is no better. Like the ethical behavior oh, they it. have. They're even worse. Yeah. They're even worse. So it's like, guys, shut, look in the f***ing mirror. Like, sorry, I shouldn't curse on YouTube, but look in the mirror. You know, like your incentives are worse. You're producing crazy sh you know, which I get. Like, again, it's for the algorithm. I understand that you're operating by those incentives. Like, and also, like you said, they have no formal process for mm -hmm. correction. They have no formal process for anything. It's just, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's worse than the traditional world, which is also a mess, you know? So... And it's like, people are like, well, we have Tim Cast. We have Tim Cast. He's the news, Pete. He's the news. What is Tim Cast going to do if the news goes away? I, I know enough. I've seen enough Tim Cast. Three fourths of what he does is just coverage of what someone else did. 100%. Like, but also, like, I mean, someone like Tim is a good example of Tim is a commentator. He doesn't do original journalism. As far as I've seen, maybe he yeah, does no, I don't think he, his org sometimes does. Yeah, exactly. Okay, fine. But he's primarily a commentator. Mm -hmm. So he's commenting on the news, as you said. And if there aren't journalists to sort of like create that news that he can then get outraged about and spin and lie about or twist the facts or whatever. Like, I mean, I find Tim and I know Tim used to work in news. Tim has become fundamentally dishonest and same thing with Glenn Greenwald and stuff. And I'm sorry, I know people stand these people. They lie for views constantly because that is the incentive of the internet. And it's very frustrating to see them heralded as like independent journalists when actual independent journalists, people that actually try to go out and do the reporting and do the journalism, it's it's impossible for them to survive. Yep. Yep. And no, there we are either it's in our culture. We're very much in a moment where being a moderate truth teller, trying to be to be to be fair. It doesn't get you a lot of traction. It's, and maybe that's maybe this is just a maybe it's just an end thing because like we were we were taught and fed by these uh, social media company algorithms so long to be used to outrage content, and now we we are the outrage. We're just doing it for free now. Uh, I don't know what it is. It just feels like it just feels like to me in this last year something changed because it's it's just it just feels like it just feels so irresponsible because I all these people I respect on Twitter after your. I know people are getting tired of hearing this. After you did your video, and it felt like all these people were basically cheering for the world to burn down. I'm like, they are. They're cheering again. I, I, I hope people. Sorry to interrupt. I really hope people watch the follow up video I did of like what happens when journalism actually leaves leaves areas. There are countries where there are no journalists. We know what those countries are like. They're authoritarian. And I, it really it's it really bothers me hearing it from conservatives because I'm like, do you not care about government oversight and limited government? But again, if if your local news shuts down, you're you're going to pay higher taxes like because there's so much corruption in the government. And so it's like for them to kind of just like be like cheering oversight. It's like you're, you're again, you're you're so stupid. You're going to do you're going to screw yourself. I don't want to live in those countries, by the way. I don't want to live in an authoritarian country with no free press and no free speech and no free media ecosystem. Like, that is a bad world. So you're not opting to go live in the Philippines or Cambodia or... No, I would love if, you know, people who ostensibly cared about free speech would defend the media's right to it and defend the media. I mean, if you care about free speech and free expression, you shouldn't be cheering the death of the media. But of course, these people don't actually care about free speech or free expression. At one point, I think a lot of them did, but I think it's more there is a there is a very much a selfishness that has kind of taken over society, and you see it in journalism a lot these days. It's very it's like and and you know I'm not obviously I've not been here over the entire course of the history of journalism, but uh, my experience from talking to people who have been doing this a little longer than I have is like. Something changed where it became more about protecting yourself, even if it came at the cost of your coworkers or it came at the cost of not mentoring people. It's like, as long as I can get my piece of the cheese, that's all that matters. 
I, I think that has, has just it's just totally invaded the system, left, right, all of it. Well, it's individualism, which America, I think we're in this like hyper capitalist, hyper individualistic economy. And America generally, I mean, our whole founding principles were on like personal liberties and in this individualistic mindset. And I think that I think that's that harms us in an increasingly connected world. Um, and I totally agree. I, yeah, I, I also agree that people, I mean, a lot of journalists are also selfish and they just want to be in the media because they want the clout. And that sucks. I wish those people weren't in the media. <laughs> yeah, I've met a lot of people. Some of the best people I ever met work in news. They're amazing. And I, I, you know, I just I'm floored by them. They're just like incredible human beings. And some of the worst people I've ever met work in media. It's a fun mix. OK, so uh, we have about, we have uh, 20 minutes or so left. Uh, I want to. This is the other thing you're kind of known for lately. You're the COVID lady. That's what people call you. Uh, well, this is really frustrates me. And I, I saw this kind of made me a little mad. I don't know. Not quite there. Okay. Can you see the picture? Can you see this? Yeah. This is the PN. Okay. You can see it. So uh, this is the kind of stories I saw. It says Taylor Lorenz skips Christmas for fourth straight year because of COVID, accuses those who don't wear masks as social murder of disabled people. Um, and then they they take because I think you did an interview one time where you yeah right after my friend passed away and the yeah the, I mean and this it... woman was the most unethical journalist ever MSNBC MSNBC I hope you go out of business um, yeah they like basically did this three hour interview I cried it like I broke for like a second at the end and they clipped that and then they made it sound like I was crying about harassment which I don't give a shit about but whatever. Yeah, and then the, the all these stories, all of them do this. So they say, "Oh, she says she has she has a disability, or she has this or that." She says PTSD and um, is mild compromised. And then they're like, "Oh, and look, here's her at an outdoor gathering. Oh, here's here's Taylor attending a party. She must be making it up." But also, like, I'm at my mask. I'm in an N95 mask. In in both of those pictures, I'm in the N95 mask. Like, there's no picture of me that's not where I'm not wearing a mask. And do I have to go to events for work? Yes. To th both of those events that I'm photographed at, I was there as press working. Yes, I'm at work events. Yeah, I have a job. Like many people, I have to go to a job despite the fact that I'm severely immunocompromised. Therefore, I have to wear my N95 mask 24-7 because other people are too selfish to give a sh about vulnerable people in this country. I think that's reprehensible. I I find it annoying because there's a little, and maybe they just don't, you know, there, it could be ignorance, but you know, it's like when I speak, when I think about uh, my disabilities or the people that I cover, you know, often with a lot of the chronic disabilities that, uh, um, you know, pain, uh, like you're saying, immunocompromised, um, it's they're hard to predict and so it's like some days you'll be really good and you can be out there and functioning and then other days you'll just be completely wiped and you can't go anywhere oh a hundred percent and there's so many things that i've missed i mean you, what you don't see is all the days that i'm in that i've all the things that i've missed which is significant things i mean i've missed like major career making opportunities i had to do a much shorter book tour because i had to spend so, thousands of dollars of my own money on covid safety protections just to do like a mini book tour, which I was obligated to do for my for my publisher. Um, but yeah, it's just like, uh, like, I don't I mean, I don't know what to tell them. And no, I couldn't fly home in the middle of the country for the holidays because my family lives in an area in the middle of the country where there is extremely high COVID rates and it's too dangerous for me to fly. I was very sick over the holidays. I still am very sick, but I'm slightly better than I was a couple of weeks ago. But um yeah, I mean, I just don't understand. And also for all these people, for all they know, I could be getting chemo. I could be on whatever. You know what I mean? I could like I could be living with one lung like they don't know anything about my health situation. And so it's very outrageous for them to like make these comments like, ah, Taylor Lorenz, Taylor Lorenz. It's like you don't know anything about my health. What are you talking about? The only thing you know is that I'm immunocompromised, which I'm open about. And that enough should make you understand why I can't travel sometimes. And we should give a shit about COVID. We should give a shit about the fact that thousands of people are dying a week and our government is out to lunch. It's bad for the economy to have this happen. And it affects the most vulnerable workers. Yeah, COVID, I agree. COVID is weird because I would definitely say a lot of the early stuff, a lot of the early theater wasn't helpful. But we've gone from the we've gone from perhaps they were 
too much to like like now it's they're just they're just they don't care they're just completely ignoring it it's like you can look at the stats like obviously people are still getting covid and there are people who are still dying but i guess we just we just don't care anymore i guess we are in the we are currently in the second biggest wave of the entire pandemic we have more covid now than we did in 2020 ever ever and so we should care because COVID is nothing like the flu. It's nothing like a cold. It's a, it's a vascular disease. If you wouldn't reinfect yourself repeatedly with rabies and HIV and other dangerous viruses, then you certainly shouldn't reinfect yourself with COVID. And I totally agree that 2020 was so full of so much bullshit and so much propaganda. And so we're like, you know, there's so much like politicized stuff. I, I have family members that are unvaccinated. I hate the way that, that liberals talk about unvaccinated people. I think it is completely alienating and toxic the way that they just are so cruel to people about that stuff i've never like boosted any of that i have always said from the beginning that this is a social problem and we as people should demand basic just the the fact that we demand clean water we should have clean air it's not that deep yeah health things are weird because it's like these problems they just don't they're like we just because we stop talking about them doesn't mean that they're still not an issue but that is kind of how a society does treat these issues well the government has sought to normalize an unprecedented level of death and disability and i think again we should demand better from our government and by the way like political leaders on both sides of the aisle have done this so it's not even a republican versus democrat thing because they're both aligned in minimizing the pandemic and pushing a very eugenic worldview where we just kill off all the elderly people and we kill off all the disabled people and we kill off all the vulnerable people. I don't, and sadly, I have to say, I don't entirely disagree. I don't know if it's intentional. I, because I, I think most of the problems today are just apathy. I think people are just like, I, it's not my problem. Right. But that's the like, that's the fundamental like disconnect is like, is they think it's not their problem until they die, until they themselves are disabled. Or they, or they suffer the, the effects of it and they don't even realize it's COVID. You know, we have so many people, um, especially in Los Angeles, I do a lot of like outreach around like COVID protection stuff. And like so many people are like, I've, I had three strokes and I didn't realize it was COVID related until finally I saw the right doctor. And they were like, this is because of COVID, you know? And like mm-hmm. we have unprecedented rates of heart disease right now and cancer and all these other things that are linked to COVID. And so people are getting sicker. That's fucked no, up. I, I, it's better. Like what our government is asleep at the wheel. Like we should demit, we should, we deserve a safe environment. And by the way, I'm not saying that means everyone has to have a mask on their face 24 seven at all times. Although that is how disabled people have to live right now. Um, I think we should just have basic fundamental protections, clean air protections, upgraded ventilation, systemic, you know, protections. Like in Japan, they have like air monitors, you know, so you can see the CO2 levels in places you can judge you know, whether it's dangerous or not for you to go in there or whether you can unmask inside or not because of the airflow or, um, you know, sick leave or just so many other things that we can do that aren't masks or whatever people are talking about, like free and easy testing. Even if we just had that, that would be such a game changer. And instead, the government hides and obscures data and makes testing harder and harder. Oh, I could rant about it all day anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's, I, I know that this is something that you're very passionate about, but obviously it would be because it has impacted you in such a heavy way. I don't want to die. <laughs> no, I, I do have, you know, my own personal health. I have a few long COVID things are holding on, but, you know, my, my grandparents who I helped take care of during the day, that, that is the, so much of that's COVID because they did, there wasn't really a lot of, a lot, there wasn't a long history of like heart attacks or stroke in my family. COVID hit, and then they both develop issues uh, in that area, and it's been devastating for my family. That was kind of like my break with with much of working in traditional conservative media because, like, that's when they were going full on. Oh, all this is made up, you know. These vaccines, it's all it's all a scam and conspiracy. I was like, well, you know, the science is kind of iffy, but you know, they're not, you know, it, it's it's a guess. But I was like, no, it's all made up. It's conspiracy. I was like, you know, I just saw my grandpa in the hospital last week, and I I'm gonna tell you. He really, he really didn't get sick. Yeah. Well, they just want to deny the deaths. And that's horrible. And deny the disability. And it's just, I think it's a, I think it's horrific. And I, I'll never be okay with it. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, uh, I, I'm going through the disability appeal process right now. I just got my representative, which is uh, oh, code for good lawyer. Luck. 
So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, not a, uh, the, it's a, it's a, America has a lot of positives. It's kind of, kind of rough, kind of rough trying to do the, to be a disabled we person. We have no safety net. And as you know, if, also if you're on SSDI, you can't make any money. It's, it's just, we have such a broken system. And I actually think most people, if you explain to them and like, I mean, a lot of people don't have any empathy today, but they do have empathy for the people that they love and care for. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like, guys, if this happened to someone that you love or cared about, you would imagine that you would care. Although, I don't know. I mean, I've seen people hospitalized for COVID and severely disabled, and then they still go out to the bars. And then, I mean, one per I've, I've known multiple people that have died of COVID that are, you know, in their 30s. It's horrible. My old coworker. It's rough. Did you have a lot of experience with, you know, you don't have to, I because because I don't want to put you in, because you obviously, uh, for those who haven't followed, the, though people say Taylor does send a lot of um, attention, let's say attention to other people. Uh, you've had, you've literally had help from the police where you had, you know, people stalking you or showing up where you live or at events. So I don't want, I don't want you to reveal any information that's going to put you I don't, in danger, I don't hear, obviously. Yeah, and I just have to be clear. Unlike what MSNBC said, I don't give a shit about that stuff. I'm I'm a public figure. I'm happy to deal with the consequences of what I say. The way that people have harassed and targeted and abused my family members and driven my parents out of their house at gunpoint in the middle of the night and horrible, horrible, horrible things and the horrible things they have done to my extended family and the way that they have tortured the people that I care about, it's fucking reprehensible. It's reprehensible. And... That is what I'm angry about. And that's what I told MSNBC, which they completely lied about, then made it sound like I give a shit about Twitter, which I don't even see tweets from people that I don't follow on Twitter. It's like, I could care less what people say about me on the internet. I write about influencers for a living. Like, people say crazy stuff about me all day. But I think the stalking and harassment is not okay. And that's what's, but the consequences have been significant for the people around me. So I was just going to ask, did you have a lot of experience with disability before before COVID, I don't want you. Yeah, I didn't really talk about it. I, I I have to say, like, I don't get involved generally on different issues outside of my beat coverage. Um, but because if if because people they do this all the time. If, you, if they're just saying that and PTSD actually can be very serious for some people. I don't have PTSD, by the way. By the way, I don't have. Just to be clear, just to be clear, I don't have PTSD. So st I don't know why these people continue to say I have PTSD when I said from the beginning they don't have PTSD, but whatever. I should have PTSD based on all the crazy shit that these people have done. I think they've given my mother and parents PTSD from the shit that they put them through, but whatever. And nothing against people with PTSD. I'm just saying that I personally don't have PTSD. Okay. So so, so like, <laughs> like, like, what kind of, what, maybe this is too personal. Like, what kind of health difficulties do you do you face? I mean, yeah, I definitely COVID can't stuff. talk about that. I had a stalker literally call when I posted by about being in the hospital, call my hospital and try and get my hospital records. Oh, so, right. I, yeah, and I'm private about it. And by the way, like, I mean, who cares? Like, you know, my friend has one of my close friends has breast cancer and was in this uh, press gaggle when Biden was, you know, took off his mask or whatever. And it's like, why should she have to disclose? She later spoke to the comms people and were like, by the way, like I have breast cancer. Like that was really dangerous. And like, I don't want to be in a room with a elected official that's been exposed to COVID if they're going to unmask. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, you should have told us you have cancer. She's like, why do I have to disclose? We also, we know how harmful it is to disclose health information on the internet. Absolutely no one should be disclosing health information on the internet because of AI, insurance claims. I mean, ProPublica did a great series about how social media is constantly used to deny claims of disability or, you know, like compensation and stuff. So nobody should be posting about their health on the internet. And I certainly do not post about my health on the internet. I, I have broken that rule many, too many times. I totally get it. Times. And look, and people need to post to find community and I get it. And like, you know, my colleague Gene Park has been posting about his cancer journey personally with the level of stalking that I have. I feel like my health is no one's business. I'm severely immunocompromised and that sucks. And I'm not, I, you know what I mean? I don't. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, I completely understand. But I cover more health disability issues, so it makes more sense for me. Plus, I've always cared about it. I mean, my sister, as people discovered from the internet when they were doxing me like um because there's articles about it but my sister was very sick growing up and um you know i've i 
care. I was heavily involved in AIDS activism. I was chair of the, you know, AIDS activism committee all through high school. I was very involved in college. I traveled to Romania, which has one of the highest rates of childhood AIDS outside of Africa. Oh, that's a, that's a terrible stat. It's, but I'm just saying, like, I care about health justice, and I've cared about this stuff pre-COVID. It's I volunteered at Rivington House, which is a place for um, people at the end of stages of their lives who had HIV AIDS. Um, so I, I've always cared about this stuff. I just w didn't think that we would see another crisis like that happen in my lifetime and then be totally normalized. Uh, by the way, Gene Park is an angel. He's my other favorite. No, I love him. There. Love that man. I, I take a bullet for him, I swear. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, I just feel like for you, it just may, it just, when I read stuff like the PM that I showed you that, 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 that aggravates me because it's like, I don't like to play this game. Like we're all little children, you know, and your brother or sister, they came home from sick early from school today. Are they really sick? Did they make it up? You know, except we're not, we're not little kids, you know, refusing to go to elementary school where we're all grown adults or at least we should be behaving yeah like and also adults. like we the majority of americans have some form of health condition it's america like the people that think like and i think that's the problem too with the messaging around COVID is there's this notion that like oh unless you're high risk you're going to be fine well the government counts anybody that's had COVID as high risk so you are not going to you're probably not going to be fine and i bet you if you look down that list of what's actually considered high risk it's a lot more people than you might think. And those people's deaths are then dismissed because people think of high risk as like very frail elderly pr people. And sometimes it's just like you have diabetes, you had a kidney transplant, you had what, you know, who knows, like you have a heart condition, like it health is transient and pe nobody's health is perfect, by the way, like we all die, our bodies fail us in the end, you know, and so we should care for each other and we should care for our health. Completely agree. Have you ever thought about covering health or disability yourself? Because obviously you seem to have an interest. I in care topic. too much about it. I don't think I could cover it because I think I like have too much bias so. in it. And I don't think I would like I would be allowed to cover it from like a journalism standpoint. I also think that world is incredibly dark and um, it's horrible. I it's like I like covering online culture because it's like, I mean, people get annoying, but it's not I, I think like especially dealing with so much death over the past few years of people that I care about, loved ones, friends, you know, all of these people dying constantly. Like it's been emotionally kind of like gutting as I'm sure so many other people have felt as well. Like we've all lost people, I think. Um, and so I think covering it would be just be really difficult. I, so much for the people that cover it. Ugh. Yeah, I know what you mean. I had to back up. I mean, I do the reporting, but I had to back away from uh, more strictly like, activism advocacy stuff because it was just too much <sighs> all right taylor well i appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today this was enlightening uh your reporting is really good i i appreciate the intellectual curiosity this has been a very long complaint of mine it's like why don't we care what happens about tiktok or youtube why how come we never we never talk about how can we talk about the things that people don't actually care about all that much about and you're the you're the one person and you've done this extremely well that is willing to go there and uh i'm glad to count you as a friend you're a very interesting person i will admit before i got to know you that i did carry some of those <laughs> negative conceits those impressions i really shouldn't have because it, it really is true you should not you really should not judge people by the headlines that's that's a terrible mistake but uh, my apologies for forever going there and i hope Today's conversation changed the minds about where uh, industry and news is heading and about you. You're a lovely person. You're always – you're very kind. I know you've done – I know you do a lot for people behind the scenes that you, you never say anything about. It's not my job to tell people. So I love having you on the show, and if you want to come back anytime, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Anytime. This was so fun, and thanks for, thanks for chatting with me. Um, where can people find you? Obviously – the Washington Post is uh, is one of them, but where else? Yeah. Um, well, I have a YouTube now, so you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I have like no followers, but um, I'm posting more videos. I'm on Instagram just at Taylor Lorenz and also TikTok at Taylor Lorenz. And I do have a newsletter on Substack that I send probably three times a year, but it is taylorlorenz.substack.com. Yeah, that's that's as often as I use mine, too. So you're not. <laughs> uh, are you are you thinking about doing any more books after this one? No, honestly, this book, uh, books take a really long time. Um, and 
I don't think I want to do another one yet, but maybe in like five years, you know, once I forget how much work it was, I'll, uh, I'll do another. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to watch. This has been CultureScape. Uh, thank you to uh, the wonderful people at Bain Books Publishing for helping put this together. And, of course, our good friends at Young Voices, a journalism advocacy group. And, of course, you, our wonderful viewers and listeners. We could not do this show without you. You all are awesome. Until next time, my friends, keep geeking out. Keep geeking out.